Hi, this is another Ask Augustine. Today I'm going to talk about dynamics. Dynamics are something that are really different in classical music from other genres. Actually, it's very, very common for uh, pop music to be um, normalized that everything is kind of at top volume the whole time. Uh, classical music, we are actually looking for the opposite. We often actually want the maximum range of dynamics. We want really to uh, play, to have as much range of expression and dynamics and character as, as possible. And uh, there are many technical um, factors in this, in producing, in playing very, both playing very, very soft and playing very, very loud is actually technically quite tricky. Uh, the easiest thing is to kind of play at sort of this medium volume. And uh, it's very important to really make sure that you have those uh, mountains and valleys and <laughs> you're playing that it really um, uh, that you have the extremes so let's talk about some of the basics of having a large dynamic range it's entirely about how you use the bow that's what it's all about and there are a couple of different factors that affect um, the volume in which you play one is the pressure or weight that you use with the bow the other one is the bow speed and that these two factors are related to one another and then there's also the position that the bow has between fingerboard and bridge and how much you angle the bow. Those are four factors that are all interconnected. It's possible to produce a pretty strong sound with very little bow speed and a lot of pressure. Or you could produce uh, also a lot of intensity but with very little pressure and a lot of bow speed. And the sound has a different character has a different quality where the bow is in relation to the fingerboard and the bridge comes into play because the, the, the more um, you sink into the string the closer you, you generally want to be to the bridge otherwise you get a sound that's also kind of throaty and a little bit distorted so the contact point matters a lot um, what I would sometimes do if I have a subito piano um, I don't have a good example right now, but uh, like let's, let's, let's say you're playing a Beethoven sonata and he's always making these subito pianos that maybe you have to get soft very quickly. It's literally to be closer to the bridge and just move the bow, bam, over there. You should be ready to change the, the place where you are quite quickly sometimes. Well, sometimes it's a transition that you can achieve by making your bow a little bit crooked. So there are also all sorts of ways, um, but it's always important where you are, um, where the bow is placed in relation to fingerboard and bridge on this axis and the pressure and the bow speed. These things are um, always interconnected. When you modify one, you probably have to revisit the others too. And the different combinations between these factors is how you produce different colors, basically. Um, about the playing with full hair or not, uh, I think that is actually less a question of volume. It does not necessarily get louder just because you play with full hair, but it enables you to uh, use more weight, to press down more. Because otherwise, at some point, you, this bow stick touches the screw the string and the sound becomes a little bit uh, bright and harsh kind of uh, it kind of pressed a little bit because um, the hair is, is does not does not provide a very hard surface when you're on the side and the bow stick starts starts scratching against the string and it becomes a little bit strident whereas when you're playing with full hair you can go much further before the stick touches so you can actually play with more more weight into it and as a result, might be able to play louder because you can just push further without the sound um, becoming in any way uh, nasty or strident or anything like that. So this is why it is important to, uh, to know how to play with full hair. Sometimes um, it's just the thing that you need to add. Having as wide a dynamic range as possible is, uh, is I think, a really good goal to have in mind. Just in general, as a musician, you want to be able to play incredibly soft, incredibly loud. There are different pieces um, with which you can practice this. Um, I was recently playing the 
the Isai Sonata number two, where at the end of the second movement it also uses a mute, which makes it even softer. But at the end of the second movement, it's really the very low end of dynamics that you explore there, and you kind of are kind of seeing just how soft can you play with like one hair on the of the bow. This kind of thing, it's not something that you're going to need all the time, but um, uh, it is useful to work on. There will be times uh, when you will encounter music that does ask for it, and playing really, really soft is very difficult because you actually have to hold the bow over the string rather than letting it sit on the string and just moving it. You actually do need to hold it and just transfer it across the string, but you're actually holding it with your hand. And it takes quite a bit of practice to have the control to do that. There are some moments in the repertoire that are very tricky because composers clearly want actually a soft sound. They want it to sound soft, delicate, but then they orchestrate it in a way that makes that kind of impossible. Um, and I think one piece where that happens a lot is the Dvorak concerto, a piece that I've played a lot. And I feel like it has a lot of balance challenges. And part of the challenge is for the conductor and the orchestra to really know how to lighten the sound and give you room. But part of it is also the job of the violinist to project soft sounds. So he will ask. Dvorak asks for pianissimo here. sweet and it's a really beautiful um, moment but there are um, four or five wind players playing up high going uh, it really is a lot of people playing with you so if you actually play this way then um, it will probably be entirely inaudible actually I, I, it's it could could happen that nobody can hear even the slightest sound. So generally what I try to do is do the exact same shape. I try to create the same shape that I'm making at a higher volume. What that means, if I want this kind of color that's very delicate, I make sure that I get louder, not with pressure, but with bow speed. So I go, try to create a sound that's considerably louder but that has that purity and sweetness in it that doesn't get I don't want it to be I don't want it to be that kind of sound that's like whoa oh, that's kind of intense because that's not actually what what he wanted he wrote pianissimo for a reason now there's something that happens when you play in a big hall is that you have to adjust your dynamics based on the space you're in. Volume is always uh, relative to everything else that's going on. We hear something as loud based on what else is happening. It's not an absolute value, but dynamic range, it's everything. This is something that um, sometimes people ask me about tips for recording in this day and age when we have to make a lot of recordings from home. A lot of things are happening uh, remotely, virtually, um, in terms of um, even remote lessons and master classes and auditions and things like this, but also performances, uh, the most important thing for me is always, um, for in terms of good sound quality, is always that the full dynamic range is there, that it's not compressed. And this is the big problem that whenever you use a cell phone, they automatically make the loud sounds softer and the soft sounds louder, so it's basically all the same. Because uh, the people who program those phones think that's what everyone wants. But classical musicians, it's of course not what we want. It makes everyone sound worse, um, sound like they don't have any dynamic range. Even if they were doing dynamics, you thought you were playing so loud and so soft, and suddenly it sounds the same, I and mean, it's really discouraging. So um, this is, uh, I think, also very, imp very important that whenever you record something, is that you really make sure that you switch off whatever setting there is
for automatic volume level, anything like that, always disable it. Always do it. Always set the level, set the level yourself. Just do a test where you play the loudest sound you can. I play the loudest sound I can for my microphones and then see if that distorts. If it does, it lower the input level. But just find um, a good input level and leave the recording like that. And of course, sometimes people say, oh, well, your speech is too soft in your videos and you ask Augustine videos. It's because uh, when I speak, it's softer than when I play my instrument. But I don't, I'm not going to do volume compression. I sometimes have done some videos where I raise the speech. Just I go through, take all the speech and raise it. But it's kind of a lot of work. But I still don't, don't want to compress the dynamics of my playing. It just feels, feels wrong because I spend my whole life trying to play with dynamics and now suddenly um, to use technology to reduce that again uh, I don't I don't think that's the way to go so make sure you play with lots of dynamics and um, hope that some, some of these tips are helpful and let's see you next time